Can we give the Lord a great hand clap of praise tonight? How many glad to be at Holiday Youth Convention in the presence of the Lord? Hallelujah. How many know he's in the room? Jesus is in the room. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And I feel the liberty of the Holy Ghost here tonight. Can we just lift up another praise unto God all across this house of thanksgiving? for bringing us safely to this place. God's going to do something mighty in our midst. Lord, we give you all the praise. We give you all the praise. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you for leading us and bringing us to this place. It is a joy to be here for me particularly tonight. It is a joy to be here. I'm Tonight I'm back home again in Indiana. Amen. Amen. I... uh, I have uh, Hoosier in my blood, and it is always a joy to be in Indiana and to be at the Holiday Youth Convention. Many memories uh, for me of Holiday Youth Conventions and youth camps and to be a part of this year. What a crowd. What a great group of people have gathered here to have a move of God. It's wonderful to see. And I... I want to give honor to the leadership of this great Indiana district. God bless our leaders. Bishop and Sister Mitchell, God bless you. We love and honor you. So good to be with you this week. Amen. Praise God. And Bishop and Sister Mitchell have been just an absolute blessing to uh, Heidi and I and the Tree of Life Church in Cincinnati, Ohio, in so many different ways. And we're so thankful to be with them tonight. And Brother Peterson and Brother Gilliland and this great committee, God bless them. Can we give them a great big hand? So good to be with them. Love and honor them. Amen. And Brother Peterson and I are cousins. His his, uh, grandmother and my grandfather were first cousins. So we've got relation there, and I so appreciate the great work that they have done and are doing and all that God has in store for them Amen. To be with Brother Hill, God bless you, Brother Hill. What a joy and a delight to be ministering with you this week. Appreciate you, honor you, looking forward to a great time in the Holy Ghost. I believe God has something very special in store for us this week. So I will invite your attention to the book of Isaiah chapter 61. I give honor to all of my friends. I have a lot of friends here tonight, and I give honor to all of them and thank them for being here and Thank them for their friendship. Isaiah chapter 61, I want to read three verses of Scripture, verses 1, 2, and 3. And this is how the word of the Lord reads. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And I'd like to concentrate our attention on the reference Jesus makes or the prophet makes concerning Jesus about the fact that he hath sent me to bind up the broken hearted. And that's what I'd like to preach, binding up the broken hearted. Binding up the broken hearted. Could you lift your voice with me and ask the blessing of God upon the preaching of his word And upon this house and every person in it. Could you do that with me right now? Let's lift up our voices together. God, I thank you for this gathering of your people. From all over this great state and this region, I pray for every person that is in this place, every soul. I pray, Lord, that you will move deeply and mightily among us and let your word have free course. God, remove every obstacle. Allow us, I pray, to sit together in heavenly places in your precious name. Lord, I pray you will break every chain. Lord, I pray you will remove every doubt. 
Lord, I pray you will heal every sickness. I pray you will fill every empty soul with the gift of the Holy Ghost. In the precious name of Jesus, we ask for a divine unction. Hallelujah. And we receive it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Amen. Could you clap your hands one more time unto the Lord? And God bless you. You may be seated. So this passage of Scripture that I have read to you and in your hearing tonight is what we call a messianic prophecy. By messianic prophecy, we mean these are prophecies about the coming Messiah. Of course, this prophecy was given in the Old Testament by the prophet Isaiah, an Old Testament prophet. And Isaiah, along with every other prophet in the Old Testament, they spoke concerning the coming of Messiah. And these prophecies had to do with a wide range of his life and the circumstances surrounding it and all that would transpire uh, as would lead up to his birth, his life, his ministry, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and so on. And when they gave these prophecies, it was a beautiful thing because Jesus fulfilled every single one of those prophecies. Like he was, like he was checking items off on a list. I mean, just didn't leave any stone unturned. He, he absolutely fulfilled every prophecy that was uttered by the Old Testament prophets. And this was one of the very convincing matters pertaining to those who doubted him, they they could not doubt him because he was the fulfillment of all God spoke through his holy prophets. This passage of scripture had to do with, yes, the ministry of Jesus, but it was also pertaining to a particular day in which Jesus would announce his arrival upon the earth and his anointed ministry. And so it was that on a given day, This particular day is recorded in Luke chapter 4. Jesus comes to the synagogue and the Bible says that he opens the scroll of Isaiah and he begins to read in their hearing and the passage that he reads is the passage that I just read to you. And it's this passage that he reads to them to let them know the time has come. The long awaited time has come. And everything that has been spoken concerning Messiah is about to come to pass. Everything that Moses uttered, everything that David uttered, everything that Zechariah and Habakkuk and Haggai and and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and yes, Isaiah. And Isaiah laid the foundation as the Holy Spirit moved upon him. He began to speak of a day when God would be manifest in the flesh. When God would walk among men and take upon him the penalty of man's sin. And this is how Isaiah described the entrance of God into the earth as a human being. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. When Jesus began to read this passage, he came to the part where Isaiah said to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And the scripture says that he closed the book and said to those who were waiting for him to continue, he said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. It was fulfilled. It was now about to begin. The work of Jesus was about to unfold upon the earth. And I want you to know that the work of Jesus Christ is very much alive and well and at work in this house right now. And he has come 
Particularly, I want to I want to concentrate and zoom, uh, zone in and hone in on this particular statement that he has come to bind up the brokenhearted. People are heartbroken. People who you never dream have any kind of an issue are, in fact, brokenhearted. People who look like they have it all together, they don't have it all together. There are people in this room right now who are devastated in their heart. And the Lord wants to heal you tonight before we go one step further in this holiday youth convention. I had a, I had a man come to my office one day and he walked in. He was a man in his late 60s, early 70s. And he was a very nice man. He was easygoing, laid back, very kind and cordial and seemed to just really be be very collected and composed. But he said, I have to talk to you, Pastor. He said, there's something that, that has been weighing on me for a long time, since I was 11 years of age. He said, my mother asked me to watch my little brother while she went into town to the grocery store. He was three, I was 11. I didn't want to watch my little brother, but... I did because mom made me watch him. What I wanted to do was I wanted to play basketball. So I took my little three-year-old brother down to the basketball court and met my neighbor friends and we played basketball. And my little brother would play off to the side. He said I watched him as he played and I, I kept an eye on him. I felt like I was keeping a pretty close watchful eye on him. Uh, then I, I, I noticed that he wasn't there but you know he, everything's fine. He said, and and I continued to play and kind of lost track of time. He said, all of a sudden, I heard a sound that haunts me to this day. He said, the sound was a train screeching to a halt, a grinding halt. And I heard the sound and realized that it was an unusual sound. Normally, we would just hear the train moving on down the track. Rarely would it come to a screeching, grinding stifling halt but it did and a a shot of pure terror went through me as I considered where's my little brother I ran down to the train tracks only to find that his little body was mangled under the train he was dead instantly he said I I I can't tell you the pain that I had concerning the death of my little brother when mom came home that day Something changed in her. She went quiet. Something changed forever in her. She couldn't look at me the same. She couldn't look at anybody the same. Something broke inside of her. And when it broke inside of her, it broke inside of me. And he said, I I can't. I have tried to live with this shame, this guilt, this pain. And I cannot live with it. I am struggling to sleep, I'm struggling to function. I have a hard time holding conversation because in the back of my mind, I know that I broke my mother's heart and my negligence caused the death of my little brother. And I'm looking at this man, late 60s, early 70s. He has lived his entire life with this pain present in his spirit. I said, oh, brother. Let me tell you, as awful as this is, as painful as this is, I can't even begin to imagine the kind of pain this has caused, but I can tell you that Jesus Christ came to bind up the brokenhearted. And I don't know, I don't know what kind of pain you have experienced in your life, what kind of pain you've carried into this holiday youth convention. But I can say beyond the shadow of a doubt that there is nothing you have done that Jesus cannot heal you from. There is no bad decision that you have made that Jesus Christ cannot step down into your circumstances and begin the healing process. Hallelujah. I rebuke the condemnation of your adversary off of you tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
you will have those chains broken. You will have the healing balm of Jesus Christ applied to your broken heart. He came to bind up the brokenhearted. He came to set at liberty them that are bruised. He came to open the eyes of the blind. He came to preach deliverance to the captive. He came to open the door of the prison bound. And yes, sir, yes, ma'am, he came to bind up the brokenhearted. Hallelujah. I, I, listen, I've been working in the work of the Lord long enough now to know that what you see isn't always what you get. Behind that well-crafted smile, behind that well-crafted presentation of your person, there is often a broken heart, there's a broken spirit, there's a person inside that is limping along. A person may look like they have it all together, very composed, very collected, very socially comfortable, but somewhere in their past, there's a decision they've made that has broken their heart, that has broken people around them. Or perhaps it was an abuse that was perpetrated against them. Some kind of an atrocity, some kind of a tragedy that they can't seem to reconcile. And when they sit even in a setting like this, where hundreds of people are gathered together, you still feel all alone. You still feel like nobody understands. You still feel like an intruder, like an imposter, like, like you don't belong here because nobody here knows what you've done and what's happened to you and you feel broken on the inside. Well, all of that's going to change tonight in the name of Jesus Christ because God is going to heal you. You are not alone. Jesus is with you. I said Jesus is with you. And furthermore, everybody else in this room knows what it feels like to have made bad decisions and to have committed sins and transgressions. Everybody here knows what it feels like to have their heart shattered in such a way that they don't feel like they could ever really recover. But you're going to recover. It starts tonight. He came to bind up the broken hearted. We've got to deal with our hearts tonight. We've got to get down on the inside and deal with that heart. And how do you do that? How do you deal with the heart? Because you can't even see the heart. The heart I'm talking about is not a heart that you can see on an MRI. It's not a thing you can detect with an ultrasound. It's not something that you can, can, can survey with an echocardiogram. You can Google. Go ahead and Google the great heart specialists of Fort Wayne and of Indiana and of the Midwest and not one of them as talented as they are, as brilliant as they are, none of them will be able to deal expertly with the heart that I'm talking about tonight. This is a heart you cannot see. This is a heart you cannot physically touch. This is a thing that is real. It exists. It is very present. It surrounds you. It is the center of your whole world, and yet... You can't find it on an x-ray. You can't locate it with feeling after it with physical fingers. There is nobody who can deal with the heart except one, except one, except one. And I'm glad to tell you he's in the room. I'm glad to tell you that he's in the room. There is only one who can deal with the heart that I'm talking about. His name is Jesus, and he deals with the heart. He deals with that invisible thing, and this heart is so important. You can't ignore this heart. Let me, let me tell you what the Bible says about this heart. This heart is so important that if a man thinks in his heart, that's what he is. As a man thinketh in this invisible essence called a heart, 
That's what that man is. Doesn't matter what he says with his lips. Doesn't matter what she says with her mouth. It's what's being thought about in the heart that determines who that person is. This heart is so real and so difficult to to really encapsulate and understand. So much so that a person's lips can praise God, but the Bible says their heart can be far from him. This is what the Bible says about your heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So it's nonsense what the world says about follow your heart. You don't want to follow your heart. The heart is deceitful above all things. I want you to think about that for just a moment. It is not just deceitful. It is deceitful above all things. You've not met a devil more deceitful than your own heart. You've not encountered a temptation more deceitful than your own heart. The heart is deceitful above all things. It's more deceitful than the serpent in the garden. The heart is deceitful above all things and it is desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's not just a rhetorical question in the sense that we understand we cannot know it. But there's also an answer to that question. Because there is one who knows our heart. He knows who we are. He knows what we think. Our thoughts are not elusive, invisible little flashes of imagination. To him, it's like a screenplay. He sees every thought. He sees every intention of the heart. He knows all about us. This is how profound and powerful the heart is. You can can say what you want, but one day, out of the abundance of the heart, your mouth is going to speak. One day, it'll it'll just fly out. Maybe in a moment of rage. Maybe in a moment of anger. But everything you're feeling on the inside, it'll just bubble over. And it'll fly out. And what was inside of that heart will begin to manifest itself through your language, through your speech. But probably the most important thing we know about the heart is this. And this is why we've got to deal with it. It's this. The greatest commandment. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord. And him only shall you serve. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Heart. That is the most important thing you can understand about your heart. You shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Not just all thy heart, but with all thy mind and with all thy soul and with all thy strength. You shall love the Lord not just a little bit. Listen, you can't love God just a little bit. You either love him with all of your heart or you don't love him at all. There's no such thing as a little bit of love for God or a little bit of devotion to God. You either love him with everything or you don't love him at all. That's what love is. And and let me just tell you something. You cannot love God with all your heart when your heart is broken. Because when your heart tries to do something in its fullness and wholeness and totality and its allness, if you please, with all of your heart, you can't love God with all of your heart when your heart is broken. And we're living in a broken-hearted generation. We're living in a world of broken-hearted people, people who are Unable to love God with all of their heart because somewhere there's a dysfunction in their heart. It manifests itself like this. You may have heard somebody talk about giving a half-hearted effort. We give half-hearted efforts when our heart is broken. Maybe you heard someone talk about the fact that a person is two-faced or double-tongued or that they talk out of both sides of their mouth. This happens when their heart is broken. Their heart is speaking, and out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth is conveying what is inside the heart. 
And when you're with this group of people, you talk this way. But when you're with this group of people, you talk that way. It's a broken heart we're looking at. Double-mindedness is a condition and a symptom of a broken heart. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. He's double-minded because somewhere the heart got broken. I don't know where your heart was broken. I don't know when it first started. But for most people, it happens like this. It's not all at once. Most of the time, it's, it's a little bit here and a little bit there. A little chip of the heart will, 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 will be, will be uh, uh, kind of cut off from the heart. And, and, and it'll fall onto the playground of your kindergarten when you're bullied. And, and then in second grade, there'll be another chip of the heart. And there'll be rejection. And there'll be betrayal. And there'll be slander. And there'll be hurt. And there'll be abuse. And chips of your heart are just falling off left and right And because you can't see the heart, you can't see the pieces when they fall. But they're there. They're scattered. They're littered around the landscape of your childhood and your past. It's all over where you were hurt, where you were wounded, where people spoke evil of you and ill of you where you made mistakes and where your heart was broken when people broke your heart when you broke your own heart when you hurt others and wish you wouldn't have and so your heart is just lacerated the bible refers to a condition called hard-hearted pharaoh is probably the most infamous of all uh, people who were hardened in their heart his heart was hardened the hardened heart is a condition that happens when our heart breaks and we try to heal it ourselves. It's scar tissue. Scar tissue begins to form around our heart and it becomes hardened. And we've tried to heal ourselves. We've tried to cope with our broken heart. We've tried to somehow make sense of it and live in a certain way that we could, we could get through a function here and there and maybe fool people into thinking we're confident and that we're comfortable and that we're, we're happy. And, and we, we just cope and we deal and we try, to, we try to kind of muster up the courage and strength to get through one little leg of life after another. But the whole time, scar tissue is building because the heart is not in the hands of the great physician. It's in your amateur hands and you're not doing a good job of healing your heart. And so where it should be whole, it is hard. And now you don't like trusting people. And now you don't like loving people. And now you get suspicious when people love you. And sometimes you feel like you have to act a certain way to make them love you. And you can't be true to yourself and true to God because If you do, then these people will not love you. All of these are conditions of a hard heart. Maybe you've heard of the term cold-hearted. This is a person where the blood stops flowing through the heart, and it's dead. It's basically just dead, and it's cold as death. We use the word warm to describe a personality. Why? Warm is a temperature gauge. Why would, we, why would we use it to describe a personality? I'll tell you why. Because when we come in contact with a person who has a whole heart, a person whose heart has been healed, and they extend to us a love and a comfort and a grace that we're not used to feeling from people, we feel warm on the inside. It's the blood flowing through that heart. It's a whole heart. That you have encountered and it warms you. And so you might walk away and say, they were so warm and kind and gracious. You were dealing with a healed heart. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know it's time to deal with the heart. No more facade. No more charade. No more faking it till you're making it. Because I've got news for you. You're not making it. You're just faking it. No more trying to get by. It's time to get honest. It's time to get real. It's time to say, God, I need you to do a work in my life. 
In the name of Jesus, every person in this room whose heart has been broken, I declare to you that God wants to bring a healing to your life, and it's going to bless you for the rest of your days, and it's going to bless your family, and it's going to bless your marriage, and it's going to bless your children. It's time to let God heal your broken heart. Hallelujah. Somebody said, how do I let God heal my heart? You know, here's the thing. I don't, I don't know how to deal with the heart, and neither do you. The only one who does is Jesus. So you literally, you literally have to say, Lord, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to go pick up the heart and put it in your hands. But I'm giving you my heart. I'm giving you everything. Lord, I hold nothing back from you. Take from me all of the sin and the guile and the shame. Take from me all of the hypocrisy, all of the pride, all of the lusts of my flesh. Take it from me. Help me to repent from my sins. Let me give to you my heart. Take control. And I'm going to tell you something. When you give God your heart, he's going to bind up the broken heart. God's the only one who can because God's the only one who can see the heart. No one else can see the heart. It is invisible to everyone but God. But God doesn't just know what the heart looks like. He knows where the heart is. And he knows where every little piece of the heart is. So he literally can go back to that kindergarten playground and pick up the little piece of your heart. And he can literally go to that second grade lunch cafeteria and pick up that little, that little gathering of the pieces of your heart. And he can go to when you were 11 years old and when you were 13 and when you were 16 and when you doubted his existence and when you were struggling because your parents got divorced and you were struggling because a loved one died and you were struggling because you were having problems with your own flesh and you didn't know how to deal with it and you didn't know who to talk to and your heart was just breaking and breaking. God knows where every piece of your heart is. You never did struggle that God didn't know where you were. He was there all the time, waiting patiently in line. He's ready right now to pick up every broken piece of your lacerated heart, and he's going to put it back together. He's going to bind up the broken pieces of your heart. Hallelujah. You know, sometimes we feel like we can take care of the heart if it's a clean break. You know, like like if, the, if the handle of a coffee mug breaks off, I'm good with that. I can take care of that. Just go get some Gorilla Glue, put it on the end of that coffee mug, and attach it to the mug, and, and the handle of the mug, and hold it, hold it real tight for a long time. I might be able to take care of that. There are some times where things break, and we can, we can get a good handle on it. But there are other times where the coffee mug slips out of our hands. And it hits the floor with such a force that it shatters into a million pieces. And you don't know where to start. There are pieces under the dishwasher. There are pieces under the refrigerator. There are pieces under the dining room table. There are pieces all over the place. And you don't even know where to begin or what, where to look. But I want you to know God knows where to look. Jesus Christ has come to bind up the broken hearted. He's going to scoop down into areas of your life you didn't even know were broken. And he's going to put you back together again. He's going to reach down into memories that you don't even remember having. And he's going to put you back together again. He's going to heal you. He's going to set you free. He's going to lift you up. He's going to break every chain off of you and give you peace of mind and give you the ability to rest well at night. You know what I need right now? I need a witness in the house who knows that what I'm saying is true. 
I need a witness in the house because the jury is out for some of these people who have tried everything and everything has failed. But if there is a witness in the house that says, let God be true and every man a liar. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. How many remember when he put you back together? How many remember when he bound up your wounds? Here's what he'll do. He'll scrape up all the broken pieces and he'll put it back together miraculously, just fitly framed, and he'll hold it together. You'll squirm and try to get away from his grip. Don't. He's holding you together. You'll, you'll try to get away from his command. You'll try to get away from his authority. You'll try to squirm away and be disobedient. Don't. Don't be disobedient. Let him hold you together. He's making you. Hallelujah. Who you really are. He's going to heal you of the confusion. He's going to heal you of the addiction. He's going to heal you of the condemnation. I'm prophesying right now. Somebody needs to believe it in Jesus' name. He He's going to heal the broken areas of your heart. (laughs) When Naaman went down that seventh time and came up that seventh time, he had leprosy before he went down. But when he came up, the Bible says that he had the flesh as of a child. He wasn't just healed of his leprosy. He was restored back to before the leprosy ever came. The Bible says he had the flesh of a child. This this is amazing. This This wasn't just before leprosy. This was before scars. This was before lacerations. This was before acne. This was before any kind of a a problem on his skin. He had the flesh of a child. That's what Jesus will do for you. He'll return you. He'll return you to before the abuse ever happened. He'll return you to before the mistake was ever made. He'll return you. Hallelujah. I want you to know he'll make you in his image. He'll make you just like him. Somebody ought to dance like the weight has been lifted. Somebody ought to shout like the chains have been broken. Hey, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, when you repent of your sins and are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues, you are born again, born of the water, born of the Spirit. You have the flesh of a child. It's like the abuse never happened. It's like the addiction never was. It's like there never was a prison record. Hallelujah. I feel the Holy Ghost in this house. I feel like somebody needs to reach out their hand and grab a hold of what God is trying to give you in Jesus' name. All across this house, lift up your hand unto God and say, God, I believe, I believe, Lord, I believe you're trying to give me a healing right now. In the name of Jesus. Come on, stand with me. Stand to your feet, if you will, with uplifted hands and an uplifted voice. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, with an uplifted voice and uplifted hands. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to give it to God right now. I want you to be honest with him. Say, God, I don't even know how to do this. I don't even know what to say right now. But, Lord, all I know is I need you to take my heart. I don't even know what that is. But you know what that is. I need you to take the broken pieces of my life and help me. Help me, God. 
Hallelujah. Weights are falling off of you right now. I said weights are falling off of you right now. Something's shifting in your world. Something's shifting in your mind. The devil is losing his grip on your mind. He has convinced you that you are irreconcilable. But we rebuke that lie in the name of Jesus. We rebuke that deception in the name of Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord is upon us because he has sent us to bind up the broken hearted. I want somebody to run to the front of this house and say, God, it is me. It is me. I need my heart put back together. I need the broken parts and pieces of my life put back together. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm away. Lord, have your way in me. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I Lord, have your way in me. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I Lord, how? 